We entered this very process back in 2013 with a view to improving our current contract. There are huge problems within medicine in the UK currently. We wanted to improve work-life ba work balance, we wanted to improve fair remuneration, and we wanted to improve opportunities, for example, of postgraduate training. So in January 2013, the government called the BMA to the table, and discussions began around heads of terms. Now, heads of terms, of course, are a set of common assumptions or principles around which both negotiating parties already agree. You don't go back on your heads of terms, it's the bedrock against which you then negotiate. So we had agreed those heads of terms by June 2013, and negotiations began in earnest in October 2013. And these negotiations continued for a year until October 2014, when they stalled. Why did they stall? The BMA walked away from the table. Why did we walk away from the table? Because in our view, it was becoming evident that over the preceding few months, the government was not interested in negotiating in good faith. It was looking to gain our complicity in accepting a contract which was, as you've heard, unfair for junior doctors, but also very unsafe for patients. The government refused to enshrine contractual safeguards around safe working hours and safe working patterns within the letter of the contract. The government instead would rather that individual hospitals, individual NHS trusts, voluntarily adhere to best practice. As the government was pushing very hard to massively expanding the number of hours within the working week classified as social hours, as plain time. October 2014, as I said, the negotiations broke down. And at this point, the government therefore decided to refer the whole situation to the DDRB. It's quite interesting that they made that move because only a few months previously the government had ignored the DDRB's recommendation of a 1% pay rise for junior doctors. No one possible explanation for their move was that they were looking to buy time. They were looking to postpone a confrontation with the medical profession before the general election. So over autumn and winter 2014-2015, the DDRB called for evidence, written evidence, from all of the parties involved, i.e. the BMA, NHS employers and the Department of Health. Over the winter and early spring, the DDRB looked over this evidence and called for further counter-evidence or clarifications as well as oral evidence from all the parties involved. And then by the summer, <coughs> July, the DDRB was ready to pronounce on its findings. July the 17th, 2015, we woke up to these headlines. Hunt goes to war with doctors, Britain's doctors to Jeremy Hunt, it's war. These headlines were replicated across the media landscape. And what was it that prompted this flurry of headlines? It was the publication of this report, the DDRB report. This stands for the Doctors and Dentists Review Body. That's an ostensibly independent organisation which was mandated by government with coming up with a view on what our future doctors' contracts should look like. And I'll say at this point that the conclusions of the DDRB report wholeheartedly endorsed the government's view of what the contract should look like and rejected nearly every single one of the BMA's concerns. And with regards to the junior doctors' contract, the DDRB released 23 recommendations. So currently within the NHS, as a doctor, plain time is between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Monday to Friday. When you work outside of those hours, as we do, any hours that you do work attract a certain <coughs> premium payment in recognition of the unsocial hours within which you're working. Now the DDRB, endorsing the government's view, recommended that plain time be expanded to 10 p.m. Monday to Friday, and that it include Saturday as well. Thus, you would see a, an approximately 50% increase in the number of hours classified as plain time. What's our concern with regards to this? Those specialties, those doctors working the toughest, most arduous specialties, such as A&E, the intensive care unit, acute medicine, they're the doctors who already work a lot of unsocial hours. So if you're expanding unsocial hours and reducing the payment for those unsocial hours, they will see their pay packet hit hardest. They will lose, they were, we projected that they would lose approximately 30% of their total salary, between 20 and 30%.
And you've also heard, of course, that there is a recruitment crisis within these specialties, within these tough specialties. Also, and this is part of the driver behind the government's plans, it would make it easier and cheaper for trusts, for hospital trusts, to work doctors across the week for much less money. Next, contractual safeguards. So currently we have a system called the banding system. It's not perfect, but it does more or less work. And at its simplest, what it does do is that it financially penalizes trusts who systematically overwork their employees. The government recommended and the DDRB recommended that the banding system be abolished. And they did not put in its place a robust alternative. So of course our concern is that we'd see a return to the bad old days of the 90s and 80s where a normal working week for many doctors could go as high as 70 to 100 hours per week. The consequences of course are obvious with regards to the morale of doctors but also most importantly for the safety of patients because of course tired doctors cannot treat patients adequately. On the day of that report's publication Jeremy Hunt appeared before the King's Fund and he gave a now infamous speech where he laid out his vision of what a 24-7 elective NHS should look like. He implied that those doctors were somehow responsible for the excess mortality observed in patients admitted at weekends versus patients admitted during the week. And then he went on to say that doctors as a profession operate within a 9 to 5 culture or a Monday to Friday culture which of course is the utter opposite of reality and it really demonstrated how out of touch he was with the medical profession, how willfully out of touch most likely. After this Jeremy Hunt then approached the Junior Doctors Committee and asked us whether we would like to re-enter negotiations. On the 13th of August we call, called an emergency Junior Doctors Committee meeting and at that meeting we overwhelmingly voted not to re-enter negotiations. Why did we make that decision? First of all, logic. The DDRB proposals, which I've just described, were as bad as, or even worse than, the proposals we walked away from back in 2014. Also, the BMA is, of course, a democratic organization. And the views of its members, both at a local level, at local regional junior doctors committee meetings, at a national level, at conferences, and through <coughs> large online surveys, the overwhelming view of junior doctors was that the DDRB proposals were unacceptable. But the most the easiest reason why we didn't re-enter negotiations is that we had a clear indication from Jeremy Hunt's office that a precondition to further negotiations was that we accept the DUDRB recommendations in full beforehand. It's a sham offer of negotiations, actually an ultimatum. So we said no to further negotiations. As predicted, of course, Jeremy Hunt then says he will impose the contract upon us by August 2016. In September the 26th, the Junior Doctors Committee voted unanimously to ballot our members for industrial action. The results of the ballot were the 19th of November. And these are the results of the ballot. 98% of junior doctors in England said that they were prepared to take part in, in strike action. And 99.4% said that they were prepared to take part in industrial action short of a strike. So what that means, of course, is that only 1.4% of junior doctors said that they would only take part in action short of a strike and would refuse to take part in a strike. This is an overwhelming mandate. I've used the words unprecedented quite a lot, but again, this is unprecedented, and not in, in BMA history, definitely, and I think in trade union history. With the moral power and the ethical power of that mandate, the BMA then approached Jeremy Hunt in good faith and asked him whether he would like to enter into the ACAS process. Almost immediately, he refused. He refused it on social media. A few days later, however, he U-turned. And five days before our proposed first day of industrial action, the 1st of December, five days before that, we entered into the ACAS process with Jeremy Hunt's team. The point of ACAS is to see if we could get enough sort of tentative assurances from government that would allow us to call off industrial action to postpone industrial action because of course industrial action is a last resort for any group of workers. And on the evening before the 1st of December, i.e. on the 30th of November, at 5.30pm, the BMA made the decision to suspend industrial action. The BMA temporarily suspended its threat of strike action and the government temporarily suspended its threat of imposition. 
the government also, in principle, agreed to the idea of contractual safeguards with regards to safety. It then became evident to the negotiating team that the government had called our bluff, potentially, at the beginning of December. The government was uninterested in moving forward um, with us on the key issue. For example, the government, as you can see in the middle there, still referred to the November 2015 offer as the basis for further negotiation. That November 2015 offer is the DDRB. It's, it's code for the DDRB. By December the 23rd, the BMA made some relatively public pronouncements that we were pessimistic about the progress of the negotiations and that we were likely or potentially going to have to take industrial action <coughs> in January. And that's what happened. On the 4th of January, we announced that we would indeed take industrial action the following week on Tuesday, January the 12th. The vast majority of junior doctors who voted for strike action took strike action. Turnout was very good. The pickets were well attended throughout the day. We actually had minimal issues with hospital management, definitely locally and throughout most of the UK. And the response from the public, from fellow health workers, was overwhelmingly positive. Overwhelmingly positive. There was, of course, a concerted attempt by the media to shut down any discussion about the wider political issues around this contract dispute. After our successful day of industrial action, we are back in the ACAS process with Jeremy Hunt. Last week's second and third day of proposed action have been postponed. 